Ah, okay. So this is uh, uh, my presentation um, that is uh, being pre-recorded uh, as the event has gone to uh, uh, be an online event. Um, I'm going to be talking about HamBSD, which is a, a side project I've been working on building an amateur packet radio stack for uh, a BSD, and in this case it's built on top of OpenBSD. Uh, so, my name is Ian, I'm known online as IRL, and uh, my amateur radio call sign is Mike Mike Zero Romeo Oscar Romeo. Uh, I got my, my foundation license, which is the, uh, the basic entry level license for amateur radio in the UK in March 2011, so that was uh, a while ago now. Um, I did a computing science degree at uh, university. Uh, shortly after graduating I upgraded to the intermediate license um, and then I also joined the Debian project uh, maintaining amateur radio software uh, as, as Debian packages and in uh, 2016 I then upgraded my license again to the full license which is the uh, top license you, you get in the UK in 2019 uh, I went to CCC camp in Germany and we had a, a packet radio meetup and at this meetup we, we talked about the the software that was available for packet radio and I, I came away from this meeting with the idea that uh, I wanted to build something that had modern security practices, it was more robust, had some uh, test suites, uh, all of these things. As often people talk about amateur radio as being able to be the thing that survives when everything else has failed, but some of the software is unmaintained, there's no testing, there's no real um, quality assurance processes, um, and I, I wanted to build something that uh, really could survive when other things have failed. So amateur radio more generally uh, it's a hobby it's it's a hobby uh, that many people uh, like to participate in. It's a it's a technical hobby um, there are there are some that will just do the basic license and use it to keep in touch with their friends um, but you can get really quite quite into the technical details of it uh, but it does come with strict rules. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility, as the saying goes. You you are given a lot of freedom uh, with your your radio license, uh, but you need to make sure that you're sticking to the, the power levels that have been defined. Uh, you're on the right frequencies and making sure you're not causing interference to other services and to ensure that only those that are uh, competent to make sure that they're following the rules are participating it requires a license and to get that license usually you do an examination um, and it's fun so uh, there's a reason that people uh, enter the the hobby um, and continue to do so and, and it's because it's it's enjoyable so there's a, a number of areas that you can explore in amateur radio. There's antenna design, um, how electrons get converted into photons and are radiated uh, from your station. Uh, you, you can look at electronics design. Um, there's a lot of history that comes with amateur radio. So radio goes back before computing, uh, it's very very early, and uh, lots of the concepts are still the same so you can still play around with these old valve radios and, and be talking to someone who's on a, a modern set. Um, you can you can uh, use use radio just for uh, uh, socializing or or for recreation. Um, if you're really into uh, a particular area you can you can try contesting 
uh, participating in radio sport. Um, so the picture here, we've got people participating in a Morse contest. Uh, amateur radio exists in space. Uh, the International Space Station is a, uh, carries a, a number of amateur radios. Um, you can get into radio technique, um, being able to communicate a very dense amount of information in a short short space of time uh, using very clear speech, uh, making best use of the radio channel uh, is, is something that, as you can tell with all of my ums and ahs, I, I've not mastered, but uh, there, there are those that, that really get into this. Um, there's emergency communications where volunteers will provide communications to support, say, Red Cross uh, in their exercises. You can link your radio up to a computer um, through a sound card interface to uh, send uh, digital data over, over a radio. And once you've got digital data moving, you can, you can start looking at packet radio where you share the channel with other stations and you have uh, a bundle of, of data that gets sent off uh, much like an ethernet frame but on the air and then you can combine this with inter-networking technologies so here's a, a picture of a station that's got a number of microwave antennas linking together various sites um, security is is a, a topic that comes up in this project but it's important to remember that, that uh, the threat model that you might have is not the same as the threat model that HamBSD has. You cannot obscure the meaning of the message. When you transmit on amateur radio, it is expected that messages are for general reception. Um, there is a, a part of the hobby known as a shortwave listener, uh, where someone isn't licensed to transmit, but they enjoy receiving transmissions from all over and they need to be able to identify the the sender of the transmission and uh, we also are a, a self-policing hobby so there is no regulator that is enforcing the rules as such it's every every radio amateur should be looking out for any spurious transmissions interference being caused um, and, and as part of that it's it, you, you can't be obscuring the, the transmission so that it makes it more difficult for that. So in, in many cases use, use of encryption um, actually is a crime. Uh, we also need a low barrier to entry um, for, for using amateur radio and as such authentication is hard key management amongst say an, an enterprise is already a hard problem if you're distributing hardware tokens or even managing passwords um, you need a system for that and authentication of radio amateurs where you've got this international community uh, with no central uh, central authority um, authentication is hard and a lot of these networks are low bandwidth high latency networks so many of the mitigation techniques for denial of service attacks for instance where you just over provision your hardware so that it can eat the denial of service attack aren't going to work you you're working on 1200 board or 9600 board links and so being able to effectively filter packets where you're coming from a larger link onto a smaller link uh, is important in in some cases it, it's it's not a, a deliberate denial of service attack but you can accidentally denial of service attack yourself if you have a microwave link and you fail over to a 1200 board link um, failing over suddenly you're going to find that all of your flows uh, fall apart so okay so the 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 point here is that when when i'm talking about security I'm talking about a system that is robust, cannot be caused to uh, trigger transmissions that would violate the license conditions, um, cannot be used to uh, jam a frequency, for example. Um, if you if you have a small 
uh, station that's in range of a larger repeater you don't want to let that small station use that larger repeater to then jam a wider area in, in an amplification attack um, so th these are the sorts of things that I'm talking about when I'm, I'm talking about security uh, the application um, that has, has seen probably the most use in recent years on, on amateur packet radio is uh, APRS which stands for Automatic Packet Reporting System. Uh, this is a real-time uh, digital communications protocol uh, for communicating information of immediate value to the local area and it's it's similar in in ways to uh, Link 11 and Link 16 uh, used by NATO, um, AIS used in uh, 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 sort of shipping, um, and ADSB used by aviation, um, and you you have the ability to place objects onto a map and have a shared view of that map so that you can understand what's going on around you, if it's uh, pedestrians or vehicles, um, if it's aid stations, shelters, these sorts of things, um, and, and you just have that uh, shared view uh, of, of the, the information in the local area. So here's a, an example of the map from uh, Aberdeen in Scotland and we can see here there's not actually that much going on there's uh, uh, this is uh, me in my house uh, a local uh, gateway um, there's another receiving gateway there and we can see here is a local amateur who's uh, out in his car so we can see the GPS track there um, and if we look at the uh, the comment there we might be able to see a voice frequency that we can use to make contact with that station um, so it's it's not limited to just this uh, uh, packet format. You can augment the the this information with other frequent uh, other other modes. So if you wanted voice, or you wanted to send uh, images, or even uh, video transmissions, it's it's a way of having a, an overview of of what's going on and the ways you can communicate. So uh, a one a one way tracker is the simplest uh, uh, system in in APRS, where it's taking GPS data, converting it into a packet, and transmitting it on a prearranged uh, frequency. In Europe, everyone is using 144.8 megahertz. In the US, it's different, and Australia is different. And diff different regions have different uh, frequencies, but uh, Europe is 144.8 and other amateurs can see where you are on, on that map. Uh, if you go a bit further you can get a, a two-way tracker and, and here we can see this is a Yaesu uh, VX8 handheld radio and uh, there's GM4 EMX again uh, from the map but now we see on this handheld battery powered device it's received the packet looked at my GPS location and given me a bearing and a distance um, and again it's taking GPS data and sending that, that out again so that others can see me on the map. Um, it just exchanging positions isn't, isn't super useful so it's also got messaging support similar to SMS um, you take a short message, address it to another amateur radio station and again transmit it on the same frequency and you can then receive messages from others. Messages in APRS can have acknowledgements and there's a retransmission timer uh, to ensure that the messages are received. Um, yeah. And you get two-way text messaging. Uh, so that, that covers the point-to-point -point case, but here we can see that we've got two stations, Alice and Bob, and the circle here shows the range of their transmission, and we see that Alice is just outside of Bob's range, and Bob is just outside of Alice's range, but there is a, a, an area of overlap here. So if we add a third station, 
say it's up a hill or it's got a particularly good antenna um, this station can receive from both and both Alice and Bob can hear this station so we do what's uh, called digipeating which is uh, kind of short for digital repeating um, and it's it's reading the packet in and then repeating the packet back out on the same frequency the interesting thing to note here is that a radio channel doesn't necessarily just mean the frequency that the radio is using it's also related to the the coverage area of the transmission so while uh, Alice is tuned to the the same frequency as Dave and Bob. Bob is outside of Alice's channel, and Dave is in both Alice's and Bob's channel. So it's a bit of set theory going on. Um, so that works for uh, radio communication. Um, but then, if you get a bit further away, you can start bridging through the internet. And here we can see uh, a, a drive that I went on, and uh, this red track here is the car, um, and there are three stations here. There's uh, this station here, which is the, the gateway you saw in the previous map. There's a, another gateway here, and another one here. And we have a, an internet system that allows all of the packets heard on the radio uh, to be collected up by database servers uh, to give a, a global view of what's happening on the APRS network. So as I drive around uh, I go between these three gateways um, and then get the, the overview as if uh, I'd received packets from all three. On the drive, uh, here's here's a picture of uh, some some sand dunes. So these are uh, here at uh, Balmedi, um, and this was uh, part of a, a site of special scientific interest until uh, Trump's golf course came along, and uh, the environment was c considered uh, uh, beyond hope of recovery. So the site of special scientific interest status was was removed. But uh, some some of it's still still very nice. Okay, so uh, the software that that exists. Uh, this this is uh, the map view from earlier. Uh, this is uh, X X software um, called Zastia. It runs on OpenBSD. Runs on Linux. Um, and this this is capable of producing uh, the position reports, receiving the position reports. It's got messaging, um, and it's quite good as a, a sort of a client terminal into APRS. Um, for infrastructure, for running repeaters, um, something more uh, uh, non non graphical. You can use a, a Direwolf, which uh, will receive packets and send them into the internet or send them back out the radio interface and I t took a look one one evening um, for 30 minutes just to see are people keeping their, their software up to date and it turns out no they're not um, so so what we can see here is the distribution of uh, versions of the software in use and many old versions are still in use um, and it, it, it seems that in amateur radio people will set a system up and then they won't maintain it they will just leave it um, and they say well it, it works why why do I need to to change it and again with direwolf it's it's not as bad um, but there are still a number of stations running older versions um, so it's 
it's a little bit uh, upsetting that people aren't maintaining these stations a bit better. Um, that internet system, um, it's it's not really internet safe. Uh, it, re it reminds me of uh, SS7 or, or BGP, where originally it had no authentication built in, and it's just assumed that people that are connecting to it can be trusted. Um, it generally passes on anything received, and the the problem with this is that when you're running a, a gateway that can send packets from the internet through the radio onto the air, you have to be sure that that message has come from another radio amateur, otherwise you're breaching your license conditions. There's minimal filtering going on. Most of the filtering that happens is only to prevent loops in the system, to prevent a packet from going onto the radio, back into the internet, back onto the radio and uh, the transport between the gateway and the internet server is a plain text uh, transport with TCP. Uh, TLS is only supported on uh, the, uh, the time that I'm recording this. There are two servers. Neither of them have the correct name in the SSL certificates and uh, only one of them has a non-expired certificate. So I looked at the the landscape of the software that's available, and and I thought, okay, can I do can I do better? Um, and this is where HamBSD was born. So I'm building on OpenBSD, and OpenBSD was a, a fork of NetBSD in 1995, and since then, it's uh, tried to be secure by default, uh, with an emphasis on code quality and is known for its high quality documentation. And actually for the high quality documentation this has another side effect because one of the goals uh, for amateur radio is to progress uh, um, education of, of science topics. Uh, so being able to develop on a system that's already got excellent documentation means that I can then write documentation about the things that I've added to it and others can then come along, learn about the things that I'm adding to it, and also see what it's built on, and have a really good understanding of the whole system. So the the goals um, for HamBSD are to support what's known as a, a TNC, Terminal Node Controller, uh, which is a radio modem, kind of. Uh, to support AX25, which is a, a link layer protocol used in amateur packet radio and to support this APRS application and to be compatible with the existing internet system. So starting off with the uh, TNCs, the, the, you communicate with the, the TNC and I've got a, a picture of one here, it's uh, AEA PK88, this is quite old um, and this, you, you communicate with it over a serial line, so on the back here it's got a 25 pin RS-232 um, and I just plug that into a, a USB serial adapter um, and you, you send uh, packets to it and receive packets from it and it's got a very simple framing protocol so you know when the, the packet starts and when it ends. Um, in this protocol, there's there's four special characters. Um, there's the the frame end character, and then the the three uh, characters here are only used to escape that frame end. So, in the event that there's a frame end that occurs inside the data, you don't want it to accidentally terminate the packet there. Um, so you would send uh, frame escape, and then you send a transposed frame end, so you turn that one byte into two bytes. But then you have the problem of what happens if a frame escape occurs in the in the data. You don't want that to be accidentally interpreted as a a frame escape. So you again run uh, convert frame escape into two bytes, and this time it's frame escape and then transposed frame escape. So if you want to to read about the the KISS TNC protocol. 
uh, the full spec um, was uh, presented here in, in 1987. Um, the the PK88 is sat here on top of uh, TCP IP Illustrated box set, and uh, this has been my reference material uh, for understanding the the network stack. And it's 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 surprising how little has changed. Uh, uh, this, this these books were based on the uh, uh, an early BSD um, a network stack, and it's it's. Surprising how little has changed. So, yeah, if uh, we talked about that, um, the start of every frame there is there is one extra byte, which is the command byte, um, and the only one that's really important is the data command, which means here is some packet data. So, in in pseudocode. Um, when when we're sending a packet, uh, you start off by putting out the frame end, and then uh, put out the the data command, and then we say okay for each byte in the packet data, if it's a frame end, we put out uh, frame escape transpose frame end. If it's frame escape, we put out frame escape and then transpose frame escape. Otherwise, just put the byte out. And once we've put all of the bytes out, frame end. Unfortunately, you can't write kernel modules in pseudocode, so we have to write it in C. And it's actually not that difficult to, uh, to understand even when it's written in C. So, start out putting the uh, uh, frame end character into the output queue, uh, the command into the output queue, and then while we have data, um, we uh, get the, the pointer to the start of that data, uh, we work out the pointer to where the data finishes, and then we're going to say, okay, while we're um, not yet at the end of the data, we're first going to have a look at how many bytes we can do without doing something special. So we have a, a, a loop here that's going through every byte and unless it's a frame escape or a frame end we just keep going around in this loop if we find that we've reached a frame escape or a frame end uh, we go back one character so we we stopped at uh, the character just before the special character and then we go to the out subroutine in in the out subroutine we say okay uh, if uh, where we are is uh, further along than where we began then that means that we've got some characters to output and then we just uh, copy those characters all in one go into the output queue and this is a, a bit more efficient than uh, going through and putting out characters one at a time because we just get to copy that block over if there are characters that are left then we know that the next one is going to be special um, and then we say okay put out a frame escape um, and then if it was a, a frame escape we put out a transpose frame escape otherwise put out a transpose frame end because we know it must have been a frame end um, then we are uh, adding two bytes to our our statistics instead of just one byte and then we say okay we're done with this uh, block of data and give me the next one and that's it for sending frames so that that, that path is relatively simple um, receiving frames is slightly trickier um, but it's not much trickier you have to keep track of uh, when a, a frame escape has come in and then uh, unescape it. What to do with the frames once you've got them? We put them into the, the kernel networking subsystem so instead of having Ethernet frame handlers we've now got AX25 frame handlers um, and we need to have a, a network interface that uh, uses this link layer so we've got the KISS network interface 
and we can see here the output from uh, ifconfig when we look at one of these interfaces. So the things um, that, that are, are important to notice, the MTU of these interfaces is smaller than Ethernet. Um, it's a slow link. You don't want to be sending two large packets because you'll uh, hog the channel for a while. Um, you also don't want to be sending two small packets because then you have too much overhead from your your headers. And the, the link layer address, that's not looking like a MAC address because in AX25 we use uh, radio call signs and then a number from uh, 0 to 15 as the link layer address. And this means that people that are receiving your transmissions can identify the call sign of the sending station, which is a, a license requirement. Um, so once once you've got the, the KISS interface working, you can then start capturing packets in Wireshark. And we can see here uh, APRS decoded messages with positions, and these were generated by the Yesu handheld. Um, at this point, I, I stopped doing uh, kernel development and started looking at how to get packets into to user space. Uh, later on, I might go back and implement uh, APRS sockets, but for now, I'm just using uh, the BPF. Um, reading from uh, a file gives gives me packets that have matched the filter, and then if I write out to the file. Um, it sends packets through the interface. So this allows me to start writing uh, user space applications. And the first user space application that I started work on was uh, APRSD uh, that sends position reports. Uh, OpenBSD's already got GPS support from the NMEA uh, line discipline. Uh, I think it was implemented for uh, supporting NTP, but it does also give you your uh, latitude and longitude in uh, uh, the census framework. Um, APRSD is also in the future going to listen for reports and uh, digipeat reports and, and essentially act as a, a standalone repeater. Um, to form part of uh, an APRS infrastructure. Uh, so here we can see uh, a position report that was submitted into the, the Internet Database Server. You can't see much behind the report, it's all blue, and that's, that's because I had confused positive and negative um, for east and west. Uh, so this, this position report appeared in the sea. Um, in a, a mirror image of where it was meant to be. Uh, the configuration file is um, quite simple. You, you configure a, a beacon, you say it's a position beacon, you tell it the name of the sensor, which uh, in, in most cases is NMEA0. You can also hard code uh, uh, latitude and longitude and for a fixed station it's preferable to hard code it because the GPS position can jump about and give the impression that uh, a station is moving. Um, although if you're worried that your station might move and you, you want to keep track of that maybe you still use GPS. Um, and then uh, to, to set it off you just give it the interface uh, that, you, that you want to transmit on and start it as a uh, RC CTL service. Um, so APRSD sits here in the middle and can facilitate communication between Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob can both learn of APRSD's uh, existence by receiving the position reports. Um, the digipeating is uh, going to have some filtering that's specified in the, the configuration file, uh, but exactly how this looks is still something that I need to work out. For connecting to the internet server, I've been looking at creating a, a TAP network interface 
uh, AX tap, which behaves very similar to uh, uh, Ethernet tap interface, except that it's using the AX25 functions instead of the Ethernet functions. Uh, APRS ISD will cre create a TCP connection to APRS IS, which is the, the internet service. Um, and recently I implemented support for connecting with TLS client certificates. So it's possible to have now a strong authentication, um, although this is the servers have not deployed this um, as widely as, as would be hoped. Um, applications can feed packets through the AXTAP interface and uh, APRS ISD acts as a, a VPN server in that it encapsulates those packets and uh, sends them off somewhere else. And here, here's kind of how the, the stack looks. So um, to, to act as a gateway, the uh, terminal node controller receives packets from the radio, passes them into the KISS interface. Um, it, it used to be called AX KISS, but I notice I've not updated this, uh, this diagram. I used to have a separate line discipline and, and interface, but I've combined those now. Um, uh, BPF listens uh, on that interface and gives the packets to APRSD which then repeats them via BPF into the TAP interface uh, which is then uh, going into APRS ISD and then that goes out to the to the internet um, to, to the internet service uh, I, w I will say actually it's, uh, it was it was very easy to add TLS support with client certificates using the new uh, libTLS uh, API in LibreSSL. So I was I was pleasantly surprised by that. So the the next goals is to um, keep working on. Uh, using HamBSD to support infrastructure. So there are two stations licensed to run unattended in Aberdeen. Uh, one of them is an RF only uh, Digipeter, the other one is a Digipeter with a two-way internet gateway. And I'd like to move both of these systems onto HamBSD and really start dogfooding this. Um, I want to be recording uh, station reports and add, add a, a database server um, to HamBSD. I want to have privilege separation for passing of packets. Uh, AX25 has a variable length header um, and you don't know where anything is until you have passed the, the whole header. Um, which is a, a bit upsetting, uh, but I'd like to have the the passing happen uh, separately from things that can uh, generate packets and, and that sort of thing. And there's also room for innovation. Um, all of these standards have grown organically and and they continue to grow. And while there are formal specifications for uh, parts of the protocols, other parts are quite vaguely defined um, and and uh, it's it's a, a living standard um, so there's there's room to uh, add new features or do things in slightly different ways. Uh, one of these things is is uh, adding a, a looking glass to some of the stations where instead of relying on this internet service to understand whether or not a, a station has heard you, um, you can query the station directly over over the internet. Um, and one, one of the, the downsides of using the internet service to do it is the packets are deduplicated. So if a station hears you, and another station hears you, and another station hears you, 
you'll only learn about one of those stations through the internet service but if you go and query those stations directly you can see oh, okay if this station were down then these other two stations would have hurt me and I would have been able to communicate through another route and so it's hopefully going to help in uh, understanding the, the network conditions better and being able to build uh, more robust networks uh, beyond APRS uh, I'd like to add support for IPv4 over AX25 um, and and this is going to require an ARP implementation as well because uh, the the addresses are, are different. Um, I'd like to add uh, six low pan over AX25 uh, using compressed IPv6 headers uh, to see if I can um, fit those better into smaller packets. Uh, for cases where you're just talking within the same channel I don't know how I, I've not looked at how this would work yet but uh, just doing TCP over AX25 um, could be something that allows you to cut down on overheads while still having a reliable transport um, I'd like to bridge these networks with amateur Wi-Fi networks. Uh, there's a lot of uh, amateur microwave going on, um, and I know that there are uh, cards that that have support in OpenBSD that can have their frequencies changed to operate in the amateur bands. Um, this this one's just for the buzzword bingo, but uh, amateur LuraWAN could be something to take a look at um, and amateur pages for when your your system is uh, broken and you need to wake up the uh, sysadmin um, we can use POC SAG uh, to, to send notifications um, and uh, uh, working with amateur satellites and improving the the support for those, uh, that both APRS and uh, AX25 uh, can be used with uh, various amateur satellites. If you want to help uh, the project, um, I've got a, a Patreon uh, that I, I'm trying to cover some of the the expenses, uh, the the hardware for for this is not cheap. Um, you can also donate hardware directly. Um, and I've got a list on the, the website I just updated uh, yesterday with uh, hardware that would be useful. And if you want to come and hang out in IRC, then uh, we've got an IRC channel and I'm happy to answer any questions there if, you've, uh, if you're watching this on a recording later. Um, and you have questions, do do come along and uh, ask there. Uh, so I'm just going to do a, a very quick demo um, and hopefully it's working uh, and it, it, it's not going to be too complicated but I just want to look at um, connecting a TNC as a network interface and just dumping some packets to show kind of the workflow of, of how this how this fits together. So starting off creating a KISS interface. Um, and we need to put the TNC into KISS mode okay so this is the the TNC and it's got a, a sort of command line driven interface um, so I'll turn off the monitor and turn on KISS mode
Okay, and now when packets are received, they'll come through uh, the the serial line as uh, uh, kiss frames. If I now LD attach the 600 board, okay, and that's attached then that serial port to the kiss interface that we created. And then if I TCP dump on that interface, and if everything is working and I send a packet now, ah, uh, something didn't work. It's a pre-recorded talk and the demo is still going wrong. Okay, I may have found the uh, problem. Yeah, the problem was that the uh, radio was not plugged into the TNC. Okay, right. And there we go. It's decoding the header of the packet and we can see that the, the packets have come in. Um, so MMORR is my call sign. Um, and we can see here uh, this is uh, an encoding of the location. Um, APRS abuses the destination field to squeeze in more information into shorter packets. And we can see uh, MB7UAR is the call sign of the Digipeter here. Um, so that's uh, a packet was transmitted by my handheld, repeated by the uh, Digipeter, and then we've received that repeated packet. Um, here decoded by TCP dump. Um, a, f a future goal is going to be to extend this uh, TCP dump dissector to uh, get the, the latitude and longitude and comment information out. Um, but that's uh, uh, for the future. So there's a, just a quick demo and uh, we'll pretend it worked the first time. Or maybe the uh, BSD CAM people can edit this such that it appeared that it worked the first time. So if you have any questions and you're watching this as a recorded talk, um, come and hang out on the IRC. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks for uh, listening. And uh, I, I, I believe I will have a Q&A session now. Um,
or or maybe I won't, uh, depending on the the timing of the talk and the uh, the time zone for me. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks very much.